Howie Carr, in a focused little way, you're a great hero of mine because you've, over the years, told the story, the Boston story, that that somehow hasn't made any of the papers and all this coverage of, you know, the new Boston, new restaurants, new this, new that. And that is the Bulger story. The simple fact that for the first time in 25 or 30 years, we, we live in an almost Bulger-free zone. I mean, who would believe, who coming from Kansas or Arizona or California even would believe that for so many years, two brothers ran everything. Uh, one ran the state house and the other ran the cocaine cartel and they were inseparable. You could not get a dime's width between them. They were intimate. They were loyal to each other. And now, to all intents and purposes, they're gone. Do you want to explain for the beginners how this happened? Well, there were these two brothers, uh, Billy Bulger and his older brother Whitey. Whitey was a criminal from just about the moment he was born in 1929 and he slowly worked his way up through the rungs of organized crime, spent a little time in Alcatraz in the late 1950s, early 1960s and as as he was finishing up his sentence for bank robbery, his brother Billy, his younger brother Billy, who was a graduate of Boston College High School undergraduate and the law school was elected to the state legislature and first to the house and then to the senate and oddly enough as whitey began moving up through the rackets in the boston underworld his brother billy began simultaneously moving up through the overworld of uh, politics at the state house simultaneously and not quite coincidentally i mean i just wonder have you ever written it this way i see I've come to think of uh, Whitey Bulger as our Osama bin Laden in, in this sense. One, they, they'd never been seen together. Uh, for another, the, Osama bin Laden and Whitey Bulger were both empowered by the security establishment. Osama to get the Russians out of Afghanistan, Whitey nominally to get, get the Italians in the mob. And uh, in both cases, the feds produced these, these killer monsters and then Lo and behold, they disappeared. They're gone. Can't find them. But they both, to me, embody genuine and rather comparable forms of terrorism. I'd never thought of it that way, Chris, but that's not a bad way of looking at it. And the fact, too, is that they're right at the top of the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Osama's number one, and I guess you'd call Whitey number two. But, yes, in in a sense, too, that that the security apparatus, whether it was the, the FBI in the case of Whitey, the domestic terrorist, or Osama, the CIA, and the, and the military, they, they set him up, they set these guys up as foils to in, people they considered to be great enemies. And then the great irony is that uh, when the enemies were vanquished, they had an even, even more evil foe on their hands, Osama and, and Whitey. Whitey is, Whitey is a guy who did things that at least the local branch of the mafia I don't think ever considered doing which was basically uh, killing killing girlfriends using machine guns on on city streets just uh, just basically uh, random slayings of anyone who got in their way the uh, death threats against businessmen a against reporters uh, Billy Bulger of course in one of the more uh, more famous attempts to take complete control of, of greater Boston went to the mayor of Boston and suggested that an FBI agent now in prison who was basically a member of Whitey's gang be installed as police commissioner of the city of Boston. In other words, Billy Bulger was trying to put a member of organized crime in as the top law enforcement officer in the city of Boston. We already had a police commissioner, Mickey Roach, whose brother by, by good report uh, had been shot, disabled for life by none other than Whitey himself. Well, either either Whitey or a fellow named O'Sullivan, but the fact is, yeah, Whitey was there when it happened <laughs> in the uh, in the best telling of the story. Yes, uh, they, and then there were there was a uh, former president of the city council whose brother was uh, slain in one of these uh, South Boston gang wars. You have the uh, the current uh, floor leader of the Massachusetts House. His name and uh, telephone number turned up in the uh, in the address book of a mafia figure known as the Animal. Of course, he was just the divorce lawyer, or so he claims. See, this is so hard to explain to people, and even around here, a lot of people have been just unwilling to believe that we live in a town that was run to all intents and purposes by the mob. By I mean, 
if this happened, I've always said, if, if this happened in Medellin, in Colombia, you know, people would say, well, what do you expect? I mean, that's a cocaine city. Or, or Marseille, say, in the 40s. People would have said, well, you know, you've got to expect. But this is Boston. Well, Chris, I... I think, too, that you have to remember that this is not just state politics, although you and I both know that Billy had a great deal of influence over a number of statewide office holders, including Mike Dukakis, who, let's not forget, was almost like the president of the United States. However, it goes beyond that. The, the Bulger family has close, or at least Billy has close ties to the Bush family, and it goes back to 1988. Now, according to stories that are told by members of the Bush family, in 1988, it was Billy Bulger who suggested that George H.W. Bush, down 17 points in the polls, bring his road show, his political campaign, to Boston and take a ride around the harbor to point out the ineptitude of Mike Dukakis. And I've always heard that uh, George H.W. Bush thought that that was the beginning of the turnaround in the 88 campaign when he when he sailed the Boston Harbor. And the fact is, Chris, as you well know, that in, in the year 2000, when they were scouting around both parties together, uh, hand in glove, for the site of the uh, first presidential debate, guess where they picked? The University of Massachusetts at Boston, of which Billy Bulger was the president. And, of course, Ted Kennedy had sort of made his peace with Billy Bulger. He's going to have all of his papers down there at the library at Ted Kennedy Building. And George H.W. Bush and his son, they, they felt they owed Billy a favor, and he called in the chit. But this is so perfectly typical, and also of the connection between Billy and Whitey. I mean, first of all, you know, you wouldn't want him as a friend because the first thing he'd do would sell you out. In the Whitey case, he let that Valhalla ship go with arms for the IRA. Soon as it was, you know, out to sea, dropped a dime with the CIA or wherever it was, and, and, and the thing was captured. So both of them always play both sides, it seems to well, me. You, you have to finish the story. Go ahead. And, yeah. and then he takes a contract to kill, to kill one of the crew members and does kill one of the crew members for ratting out the ship, even though in all likelihood he was the one who ratted out the ship. It's like something out of an early George V. Higgins novel. The guy is taking contracts to kill people when he actually was the one who should, should be assassinated by, the, by his fellow members of the mob. What do you mark as the kind of high water peak of the Bill Bulger's power between running the state senate and having this kind of mob violence as a threat behind him? I mean, how high did it go? I, I would have to say the late 80s would have been the uh, pinnacle of uh, Bulger's power. The, the governor of the state was Mike Dukakis, and he was basically at the end a, a pawn of Billy Bulger. Uh, Mike Dukakis, who had been elected as a reformer, just had adopted a tr just a get along, go along to get along attitude. One time a state trooper in a famous incident at Logan Airport stopped Whitey Bulger from taking apparently fifty to one hundred thousand dollars cash out of the country the next day mike dukakis's head of logan airport showed up at the state police barracks at the airport and demanded to see a copy of the report involving uh, whitey's attempt to get this money out the state trooper was later uh, transferred to the boondocks and later ended up committing suicide Are you sure that wasn't under governor weld I'm positive. That was under Mike Dukakis. Okay. 1987. Okay. Either way, you know, it seems to me Bulger would have had a new dimension of unheard of power if John Silver had been elected in 1990 because he had put Silver into the race effectively with convention, convention votes, and he would have owned him lock, stock, and barrel. How do you suppose Silver would have dealt with that? Well, that's, that's a really interesting question, Chris, because I... I, I think that I'm not the only person who voted for Weld over, over Silber because I was concerned about the Bulger connection. You are not the only one, brother. I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the fact is that uh, within a few years, he ended up owning the brain of the Republican governor who, who, would, camp, who, would, end, who would run against him in 1990 and, and had made these points about how Bulger would control everything. You may you might say that he had more power at the state house level under Weld than he even had under Dukakis. Absolutely, I never figured this out. Why Weld took a dive? There was that famous uh, moment in the summer of that campaign. I'm sure you remember it. 52 Bulger cocaine associates all arrested, not Whitey, but the whole gang, 
and he was an unindicted co-conspirator. Bill Weld denounced it, uh, said this is what we're looking at in the Democratic Party. But within a few months, he was in bed with Bolger, and the two of them ran everything under that state house together. It, it was like Bill Weld. It, I, this is maybe te technical for the for the listeners, but he had a he had the veto power uh, he could uh, sustain any veto that he wanted to because he had 16 senators in the uh, in in Bulger's branch the the state senate he started appointing his own state senators that were elected out of democratic districts to to a uh, bureaucratic positions because he he somehow thought that Bulger was his friend that he didn't need to worry about sustaining a veto in the Senate it was a it was a terrible tactical mistake for for Bill Weld and for the Republican Party and I would argue for the people in general but for some reason he just he just grew to really like Bill Bulger and he he uh, of course uh, had made jokes as we know he made jokes about Whitey at the St. Patrick's Day breakfast when uh, Bulger had his retirement then or earlier this year at the Boston Public Library, who was the host who flew up from New York, none other than William Floyd Weld. What is that about? I, I, I just never got it. it. Although it may also have gone back earlier in the fact that Bill Weld had been a U.S. attorney, federal prosecutor, who was in on this this kind of monstrous <laughs> conceit that, that Whitey was helping the feds and the U.S. attorney and the organized crime uh, uh, strike force uh, get the Italians. I mean, was that the was that the critical mistake that Bill Weld had made and had to kind of live with? He didn't seem to take it seriously. I get the feeling that that a lot of these these Yankee types, for lack of a better phrase, didn't take Billy that seriously. I mean, going back to the days of Frank Sargent, the former Republican governor in the late '60s, early '70s, who offered him a judgeship. Even sen senators like uh, Oliver Ames, you still talk to them, and o old Yankee types, they, they found him to be a charming rascal, a rogue. Bill Saltonstall, the state senator from up on the North Shore, uh, son of Leverett Saltonstall, the US, former U.S. senator, another guy who really loved Billy Bulger. And I, and I think for some reason he, he was able to, to charm well like he, like he was all those earlier Yankee Republicans. There was a, there was a weird moment in the hearings in uh, in 1998 uh, w when Bill Well was called as a witness as the former U.S. attorney. They were trying to decide whether they should continue the racketeering prosecution against Steve Flemmy, Whitey's partner, and Whitey because they were FBI agents. And Well recounted this story about how one, the number two guy in the FBI office said to him of, of, a, of a of a man named Brian Halloran who was shortly thereafter mowed down in South Boston by Whitey himself, he said, you know, I wouldn't want to be standing too close to, to uh, Brian Halloran about now. This is what the FBI agent said to, to Weld. And as he recounted it, he began chuckling on the witness stand. And it was a very perplexing moment because everybody in the courtroom was thinking to themselves, what's so funny, Governor? Why is this man laughing? Uh, you're right. He did. He did take in all of those sort of Boston Symphony Board and Massachusetts General Hospital Board members. They loved little Billy Bulger. He's such an amusing fellow there from South Boston. All that stuff. But it seems to me part of the problem was that they were allowed to do that. I mean, he was allowed to make himself this little leprechaun. He could sing a song on an occasion. Didn't watch television. Pretended to have read, you know, to be able to read Latin and Greek. Uh, that was partly because uh, the media. That's us. Everybody but you, in many ways. Although I had a little hand in it sometimes. Uh, You're being modest. Chris. Well, no, no, but we got to we got to talk about the media role in this. Allowed Billy to uh, get away with this picture of you know little Mr. Shamrock. Uh, but I, I, I want to actually, I'd like I'd like you to cover what you think are both the heroes and the villains of this piece. And I just throw out for a start on the villains. Of this we'll come to the heroes, but you know the FBI, totally incompetent here, including you know, vaunted reputations like Jeremiah O'Sullivan and uh, all the federal prosecutors, including Bill Weld. John Silber got taken in, lock, stock, and barrel. The church got taken in. Bill Weld, for sure. The Globe, it seems to me, has had a mixed record because Kevin Cullen did some very good reporting work. On the other hand, Mike Barnacle fronted freely for, not just for Bulger, but for your friend Zip Connolly, the FBI agent who was, who was orchestrating the defense of Bulger. Now in prison. Now, and Barnacle should be there with him. I mean,